set us fall upon the blue sky. Let the church say amen. And it is good that God has again blessed us with so many blessings. Uh, even though we've, we're experiencing a lot of heartfelt pain, and we want to extend the church's prayers and outlook to uh, the, <coughs> the Lands family, the Osborne family, the Iverson family, and if I forgot one of the other families that related, we are still praying for you at this time. As you go through grief, we go through it together. Because, again, we are God's family sent to show his love to a broken to a broken world, to share in his hope of eternal life, to serve his community, and send others to do the same. We do this by living a life of 4D, denial of self, discovery of God and his word, devotion to God and his purpose, and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. We are in a series this morning, and Cedric really broke it open. And I would joke with Cedric, I wanted just to play his tape of a sermon, and after we play it, we'll stand and sing the song of invitation. But Cedric said, no, you have to preach. Anyway, last we were talking about impediments to, to being empowered or impediments to God's power. Things that block and impede uh, God's power to us. And it can impede on our mission for Christ. This morning we're coming from Psalms 22, verse 11, and some of the other surrounding verses. When the world gets darker, we ask God, where are you? When the world, when we would go through mess, and a lot of us are going to be going through mess, have gone through mess, or learning from our mess, we are distressed, stressed out, troubled, we're, fa we're facing pain inside, and we're facing pain outside. Troubles are bothering us on all ends. It, I, you know, I used to want to listen to the news to find out what the heck is going on. But when I turn on the news, I don't want to know what's going on. It's just mess. And the thing about it is that we all go through troubles. But what God has set up for us and designed to help us to express our emotions deep to God is through singing. I enjoy gospel songs, and I'm really listening. When I was younger, I didn't listen to the words. But as I go and experience life, the words have deeper meaning. And they, they help me, and they bless me, and I'm sure they bless you also. And one of the ways that this gives us relief by singing, and we are to consider God and connecting to God. One of the ways is through songs, and one of the best books about songs is the book of Psalm, Psalms. Psalms, God's hymn book. In Psalms, it is designed to help us to express our deep emotions to God, giving thanks praise, celebration, wisdom, and lament. Laments are the sad psalms. And believe it or not, that's the largest group of psalms, knowing that God has designed these psalms to be sung when we're down and out. We're to seek solace from God, seek comfort from God by singing these songs. The more we sing, the more we can appreciate the hand of God. They help, and the thing about it is, they help us to express to God all our struggles, our sufferings, our disappointments. And, is to, and the idea is to pray to God to leave your burdens at the Lord and leave them there. Psalms was designed for us to sing and to identify with the psalmist. And what God wants us to do as we sing and as we also pray is to get it all out and not hold it in and give it to God. He doesn't want us to sing it, let some of it out, and keep it in. 
Because the more we keep it in, the more it's going to hurt us, the more it is going to damage us emotionally and spiritually. We are to go to God, and if we have faith in him, and if we trust him, we are to spill, forgive the term, spill our guts out to God. Give him everything. Give him all your frustrations. When the boss has dogged you at work, give it to him. If you're having difficulties in your marriage, your mate, and you don't see eye to eye, and anger is starting to build up, give it to him. If you can't deal with some folks, give it to him. If you don't like the circumstances in which you are living, give it to him. Give it to him. Unload. Don't try to hold it in, and don't seek other aids that are unspiritual, ungodly, and they will lead you away from God. Give it to him. That's the idea, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, but when you give it to him and you unleash and give it to God, there's no sin in it. You see, when we don't study the Bible correctly, we pick up some of our uh, um, fables or some of our misteachings. God wants you to come to him, and if you study the Psalms, David complained to the Lord about his situation because he was getting it all out. The key is when you get it out and get all that stuff out from you to relieve you, you don't want to be left with sin and anger. Sin and anger will fester in you. And instead of dealing with your anger, instead of taking your anger to God, you hold it in and ego and Satan enters in and we try to solve it ourselves. You are to go to God. Do you believe in God? Hello, do you believe in God? Do you trust in God? Then guess what? He wants you to come with all of your frustrations, all of your anger, all of your disappointments, and give it to him. And if you trust the Lord and love the Lord, sooner or later, he will listen to you and, and help you. But you have to be spiritual, biblical, and wise enough to see when he answers or tells you to wait. Or tells you no. You're to get it all out. My problem is if I don't get it out, I, I turn into evil John. And I turn into a bad man. That's my wife. And I, I have no shame in that. I don't try to come to church and act like I have it all together. I, I don't. So when we come to God, we're to get it all out of ourselves. To get the relief and to get some comfort. And when we sing... The songs in the, in the word, these are to help us deal with it. Because if we don't, when we're going through pain, and all of us go through pain eventually, all these trials, we will start to question God and his purpose in a difficult period in our lives. We can question, Job questioned God, but, but God came back at him. Now prepare yourself like a man, because I'm going to ask you some questions. But God wants us to come to him. But if we don't, we will start to blame God for our anger and for our troubles and struggles. Instead of taking the idea that I need to come to God and give it to him, we're going to start to blame him and, and maintain a constant anger to God. Why did you do this? What's another thing we say to God? Don't you hear me? Don't you? And we think God doesn't understand. You don't understand. And we get mad at God. And we get frustrated. Because Cedric talked about frustration when we're dealing with mess. And we begin to attribute things to God or we see him as less than God. We don't think that he can help us. Oh, you don't know. You don't know her. You don't know him. You don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. You don't know my relatives. And we forget that God is all-seeing. God is all-knowing. God knows everything. He knows your frustrations. But we hold it in, and I can't tell God because I'm ashamed. I, I, can't, I can't tell my brothers and sisters, so I'm going to just hold it in. And guess what happens? Your blood pressure is going to shoot up. And your nerves are going to get frayed and will begin to physically manifest itself in you. 
Do we love God? Do we love God? Do we love God? So, as we are in our study of Psalms 22nd, the 22nd Psalms, we are learning through this text that David was going through a difficult spot, a difficult patch, some difficulties. He's got some issues that he is dealing with, and these issues are threatening his life. The other beauty about this text is that David, David wrote Psalms, but David was also a shepherd. David was a warrior. David was king, but David was a prophet through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in this unique text, in Psalms 22, David speaks, and he speaks, and he looks into the future. And in this future, as the shepherd he is, he points to the ultimate shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. You see, David had the ability to see into the future, and this is in regard to Christ. This psalm is also called uh, the, the Song of the Messiah, because it talks a lot about Jesus, specifically Jesus on the cross. And as we look at this, we understand that David was going through some situations, but there are some situations that David had not gone through, and he is pointing directly to Jesus. So as we read the 22nd Psalm, remember, that David is pointing to Christ. He is pointing to what he went through. You see, on the, in the, when the Bible talks about the crucifixion of Christ, it's very modest. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it just says he was crucified. Like they don't want to deal with the details of it. There's a few details, but it's out of modesty that they say, hey, I, I can't talk about this. I, could, I just want to let you know that he was crucified. In Psalms, you get to get in the head of Christ as he is being crucified. You may wonder, what's the deal with all this? You begin to understand that I may have troubles, I may have difficulties, I may have issues, but I don't have them like in Psalms chapter 22. My issues pale in comparison to what goes on in Psalms 22. So what I'd like us to do is to look at just a section which I've been assigned, but on your spare, read the whole thing. And on top of that, I got, Craig, I got to leave something for you too to, to deal with next week. So we can't deal with all of this. But we want to look at some things in Psalms chapter 22. The name of this message is that you are far from me. Dealing with the issues of pain and suffering. And the question comes up and the statement comes up that you are far from me. Talking about God. What we'd like to do in this as we pull out these points in the text. We'd like to say that we're going to be dealing with the abandonment next the agony, third, the answer. The abandonment, the agony, and the answer. Psalms, chapter, I'm sorry, Psalms 22. Now what we need to understand, let's look at verse 22 and see what the Bible says. When we look at the abandonment. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. This fits in line with the first verses that Cedric talked about last week, where David says, and he quotes Christ, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the New Testament and in the Bible, when he repeats it twice, this is talking about this is a dire statement. He's calling upon God. And he's calling upon God because he's in a serious situation. 
Many times we call upon God. You know, God, I want you to hear this. God, this is important. I want you to pay attention, Lord, because I am in serious pain. I am in serious suffering. My mind is going. I need help. So it's all right for us to call upon the Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, and I find no rest. Everything else is going to be dealing with this idea of God. And we are moaning to God. We are crying to God. And we're looking at David's response. But he's also, again, pointing to the Messiah. And he says, the interesting thing, he says, be not far from me. You must understand, as we look at this, and we look at this distress, and we look at that, that we're questioning God, doubt and disbelief can creep in. And then we can get the wrong idea about God. What Satan wants to do is to isolate us in our pain. He wants to separate us from our relationship with God. He wants to keep you think, not thinking about God, but focusing in on your pain and not looking at the right way to find relief. You see, G Jesus warned Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. When he heard the words that Jesus would die and he tried to rebuke Jesus for that. Understand, when you are going through your hurt, when you are going through your pain, when you are going through suffering, Satan is desiring to separate you, to isolate you from God. If this is a temptation. This is something that we bear. And what happens is, and look in real life, when things get hard, then we stop fellowshipping. When things get hard, really hurtful, then we disappear. Leela, baby, it's good to see you. And you're here. It's, it's a hard time. But you're seeking the solace of God and others. When it gets tough, don't bail out on God. When it gets tough, hold on to your faith. Sure, our, my faith gets weak when I'm suffering. But who else am I going to hold on to? I can't hold on to any rapper. I can't hold on to any basketball player. I can't hold on to any, and I love jazz, but I can't hold on to jazz musicians. There's times when I can't trust Miles Davis. I need to listen to the voice of God. So he's trying to isolate us. Now I want you to notice something. Go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. And I want to show you something. Jesus, and we don't, we don't put two and two together. Jesus suffered greatly. Jesus suffered him, suffered greatly while he was on the, while he was being tempted and while he was going through the passion of Christ. Now watch what this says. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. When Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to what? Be sorrowful and troubled. Jesus had the cross in front of him. And Jesus' humanity came through where he began to feel sorrowful and troubled. And he sought companionship during this time. Jesus knew what his mission was, but even then, he could be with somebody. He sought human companionship. He sought the companionship of his disciples. Guess what that tells us? When you are going through things, Satan would like to make you feel that you're alone. Nobody knows the trouble I've, I've been or been in or whatever. But guess what? 
What God wants us to do is to seek the comfort of one another, to seek the comfort of spiritual Christians. Not, not all Christians are spiritual. You want somebody that you could trust, that's not going to blab your business, and it shows a th sympathetic ear. And also, too, if you're going some issues with some issues, I believe when the Bible says in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love bears all things. The idea is that you know a person's issues and problems, but you still cover them from other people. You, know, you probably talk to them about their sin and they struggle with sin. Our job is not to find out what your sin is and publish it. Our job is to bear, put up with, to bear another person, to shield them. So when the other people talk about you, you've got somebody that has your back. I said, look, you don't know what you're talking about. Have you talked to him about his issue? No, but I hoid. Jesus sought the comfort of his brothers and sisters. I mean, well, his brothers at the time. But when we get to verse chapter 26, verse 56, unfortunately, when they came to arrest uh, disciple to arrest Jesus, and all, but all verse 56, but all this had taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. These are the same men that said, Jesus, I got your back. Jesus, I'd rather die than let you, let you get arrested. I'd rather die than let you die. Peter said, look, these brothers may do it, but I never will. The Bible says all of them fled. Even though we strive to have companionship, sometimes human companionship will leave us hanging too. So as we go through issues, there's a sense of abandonment. And with Christ, Jesus experienced abandonment. Now another thing that happened, when Jesus went to the cross, God couldn't look at him. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, quickly, and it states, Second Corinthians 5 and 21, the Bible says, For our sake he was made, he made him, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, God had totally abandoned Jesus. you got to understand what this means. All through Jesus' existence, from the beginning of time up to this period, God was with Jesus. All through the book of John, Jesus says, my father and I are one. When you see me, you see the father. When Jesus was on the cross, the father had to turn his head away from him because Jesus became the sin substitute for us. Jesus took all of our sins, all of them, at one period of time, all of mankind's sins, and brought it upon himself. And also that, he had to deal with the wrath of God. No human being could take the wrath of God. You can't. You can't. I think you'd explode. You cannot take the wrath of God. And again, I said this again. You don't see all the spiritual aspects that go on when the wrath was poured on top of Jesus. There was only one person that could take it. That is the Messiah. There was only one person that could take it. That is Jesus Christ. God had to turn his back on his only begotten son. This relationship was broken but only for a short time. And you know what happened? The sun refused to shine. There was darkness over all the land. It started at 12. It says the sixth hour until the ninth hour, until 3 o'clock. Darkness. This is not a solar eclipse because the Jews could look on their calendar and find the full moon and figure some of that stuff out. Darkness is another symbol for God's judgment. 
Jesus was under the judgment of God at that time. He didn't do anything, but he loved us so much that he took on the wrath of God. And it got so bad, Jesus thought he was alone, which he was at this time. And God is pouring his wrath upon him, and darkness covered the land. You can't explain it, but it is a supernatural act of God. So Jesus knew about abandonment. Has it gotten dark when you were abandoned? No. This is supernatural. Jesus is taking the sins of the world. He's taking the sins that, no, that you only know, that you did, that you hope nobody finds out. When you're alone and we start to admit fault to one another alone, that's the stuff that Jesus got rid of. And the public stuff, and the private stuff, and the dirty stuff. Jesus, when we repent, forgives us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So the, Jesus took the wrath of mankind, and he was separated from God. He was abandoned. That's true abandonment. But we may feel we're abandoned by God, but it hasn't gotten to the point where Jesus, of, of Jesus' abandonment. I want you to, I'm giving the rest of my lesson away. God hasn't gone anywhere. We are the ones that leave God. But yet, in our humanity, we want to blame God for some of the mess that we get into. And since we blame, I ain't going to church no more. I ain't going to read my Bible. Where was God when somebody died? Where was God when I had all this problem? Where was God when I had my surgery? He was right there. We walk by faith and not by sight. The next is agony. Agony. This is insight to the agony on the cross. You know something? I'm on, there's a lot of agony here, and we're only going to read and comment on a few things because each of these things we could spend a long time on. But I want you to look at Jesus. Form a picture in your mind and look at Christ when he was on the cross. I want to say this also. Because of history and the paintings that we see, they're, they're kind of sanitized. We have records of Roman executions. When you were crucified, they nailed you on a cross and they took your clothes off. Jesus was naked when he was crucified. Why do you think it causes so much shame? Here you are in front of your mother and others that loved you, and they took off your clothes and beat you to death almost. And Rome is saying, look what we'll do to you. And they're forced to look at that. Do you see Jesus in your mind? Never take communion for granted. Never take Jesus died for my sins. Never take that stuff for granted. It's, this is not routine. Christ died for you. Don't go to sleep on it. Don't talk all through it. This is important that we understand the fellowship and the cost of Jesus Christ. This is not nothing routine. God loves some unlovable people. Watch what it says. Be not far from me. Why? For trouble is near. David says there's none to help. And for Christ, understand this. He had to go through this. And then I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead because this is getting good to me. When you go through mess, it is not eternal unless you die in it. You go only, this too shall pass. Whatever you go through, it will pass. It will pass. It's so funny when I look back when I was a teenager, and I'm still, it, I'm still crazy. When I used to break up with the girl, really the girl broke up with me, I would be playing some, uh, Cedric could remember sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm down and out. I got some Isley Brothers playing. I got the Shia Lights. Have you seen her? I thought I had her in the palm of my hand. I'm walking on the bench. The kid, children know my name day by day. I'm playing some Isley, I mean, Isley Brothers and that stuff stuck with me. Stevie Wonder, a lot of the breakup songs, because I'd be in pain, you know. John, you know, that's just one girl. I ain't going to date nobody no more. I'm going to be a eunuch for the Lord. All you women are crazy. 
He said, you know, but after a while, boom, boom, and you see somebody else, and those vows are gone. This, too, shall pass. Whatever stuff that you are going through, this, too, shall pass. Now, if you're married, the pain will pass. Don't say, she's going to die. No. 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 All this pain shall pass. It is not eternal. It is not permanent. But we think, oh, God, help me. This, too, shall pass. This is to build up our faith. This is to build up our faith. Repeat it, Usted. This is to build up our faith in Christ and our trust in God. We will get over these things, and if, but we got to be in tune with God. People that aren't in tune with God, all Satan wants you to do is jump out the window and kill yourself. When it gets that bad, you don't have to kill yourself. Watch. Now let's watch this agony. Watch what he says. Verse number 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of the Bashan, of bulls of Bashan surround me. What he's saying very quickly is that these are special bulls of Bashan. These are bulls that existed in Palestine, but they were wild bulls. And they were wild bulls. The bulls could not be tamed. They weren't good for owning because they would go after you. These were big, wild bulls. Beast. Jesus is saying that the people that are looking at me are like wild beasts. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, they try to kick him when he's down. And have you ever heard about that expression when somebody is down and out and hurting and other people still want to hurt you even though you're down and out? That's pretty doggish. So Jesus was being surrounded by these bulls of Bashan. Not literal, but figuratively. These people are rough, and they parade around acting like top dog gangs. I'm a gangster, baby. And they're, they're walking around Jesus. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring, like a ravening and roaring lion. In Matthew 27, what did the Bible say? They wag their heads to Jesus, and they talk bad about Jesus. In the, in the uh, New King James, it says they blasphemed to Christ. He saved others. Himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. Then we will believe him. Talking a lot of smack, a lot of mess, a lot of hate. When a man is down, and they're still talking about him. They're still talking bad about Jesus. And again, the other translations say they, they blasphemed on him. They despised him. They ridiculed him. They taunted him. Here you are beaten because they beat him with a, with a whip, and he's mocked, and he's nailed to a cross naked. Now, God, where, now where's your God now, Jesus? They try to humiliate him. And you got his mother there. And his other relatives listening to this trash. How do you think? And these words hurt Jesus because the Holy Spirit says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. These words hurt Jesus. He did all this because he loved us. He put up with this stuff because he wanted to break you from the bonds of sin. Let's go a little further. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roar, like a ravening and roaring lion. In other words, it's like an animal that is waiting to attack, and they're snarling and they're roaring. Jesus compares them. And also, too, what the text is hinting, that these are minions of Satan. They're allowing Satan to rule their lives and to speak blasphemy against Jesus. They're not crying, oh, how I love Jesus. They want him to die, and they're walk, going around wagging their heads. You know, sometimes I kind of see us there. You know how sometimes we like to talk and wag our heads and point the finger at people? Think about it. Verse 14, 
Look at, and this talks about his physical state. I am poured out like water. In other words, Jesus is being spent. His physical condition is that he's being poured out. He is being emptied. He is giving his total self, but he's pouring out like water. And my bones are out of joint. When you are crucified, they nail you, but they pull you up and gravity pulls the rest. So your body and your joints are being pulled out of socket. Jesus is in extreme pain. Never forget that. Jesus suffered and he was in agony on the cross. Watch what else it says. My heart is like wax in verse 14. It is melted within my breast. That's another way of saying that Jesus' heart was failing. What happens, and I know the doctors know about this, when you're hanging on the cross and you're, you've already gotten beaten up and you're nailed to it, your body descends and these fluids build up upon your heart. Jesus' heart is melting like wax. It's talking about his physical condition. What else does it say? Is melting within my breast. My strength is dried up like potsherd. Potsherd is a clay pot. But what he's saying actually, that this potsherd is broken. He said, my strength is breaking. My strength is dried up. I'm on the cross. I'm drying up. My sockets, my, 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 my bones are out of joint. I am hurting. Not a pretty picture. Never again take the crucifixion for granted. Watch a little further. My tongue sticks to my jaws. What do you think that means? He said it from the cross. I thirst. But that also meant he's thirsting for the hand of God. So his mouth is dry. It is sticking to the side of his mouth. What else does it say? You lay me in the dust of death. What that is saying is you lay me in the dust of the grave. For, the do for dogs come past me. And a company of evil doers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. So Jesus in this and the psalmist is surrounded. He's by himself, but surrounded by a bunch of evil people that want his destruction. And at the beginning of this crucifixion, being talked about, he was spit upon. They beat him and they did all these things. According to the biblical record, the first thing Jesus said on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They're being led by Satan, and they don't know what they're doing. Dogs. In other words, a dog is a no good, evil, conniving person that encircles me. He talks about they have pierced his hands and his feet. Now watch. I can count all my bones, and they stare and gloat over me. What that is saying is that when Jesus was on the cross, he could look down, and because of his condition, he could count his bones. Amen. He could see his flesh. And again, the back of his flesh was torn up. I don't know if they whipped him in the front or whipped him in the back, but he could count his bones while hanging on the cross. See, this is a different side of the crucifixion. This is a different side that Jesus went through a lot of mess. So he could count his bones. And he said, they stare and gloat over me. In other words, they, again, you're kicking somebody when they're down. Kind of like when the guy threw the helmet at the other guy, but that's something else. Hit him when he's down. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, to tell you how cold that is, this may not seem like much. But normally, when a person was to die on the cross, they take his clothes later. They disrespected Jesus so much. He was still alive at this point. And they took his clothes and gambled over him before he even died. They showed Jesus disrespect. Do you see what they did to my Jesus? Do you see what they did to your Jesus? Do you at least see it? This is serious business. Never take the crucifixion for granted. This is agony that he endured on the cross. 
This is pain and suffering that he uh, uh, endured on the cross. Jesus was alone, but he paid for our sins. And we're told that he went through this because he loved us so much. Let's look at the last point very quickly. The answer. Drop down in Psalms 22 to verse number 21. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Drop down to verse number, yeah, 21, excuse me. He says, but you, oh, first, first look at verse 19, I'm sorry. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. Oh, you my, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Come quickly. And it says later down, it says, it's, it says, technically it says in verse number 21, you have answered me. I'm going through this pain. I'm going through my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus says, you've answered me, which means that I heard you, which means that I understand your pain. We may think that God has gone somewhere else. But you see, in Jesus' case, God couldn't help him because he had to die for his sins. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He said several things. He said, it is finished. The work that I've done is finished. The work that I've done is finished. I have, I have been, God has downloaded all the sins of all mankind into my body. It's finished. So it takes maybe six hours to accomplish the work spiritually. He said, it's finished. Then Jesus says, and he, he says, look, into my hands I commend my spirit. I know enough that I trust in God, and I trust in God so much, and you can't kill me. You could talk about me. You could beat me. You could crucify me. Jesus gave up the ghost. You see, the Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, and he gives up the ghost, showing that he still has power over the situation. Jesus died for our sins, and he gave up the ghost that we may live. So he dies upon the cross. But the beauty of it is that Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. But we sometimes, we sometimes don't listen to God, and we don't have enough patience and trust in the Lord to understand. When Joshua was uh, getting his commission after Moses died in Joshua chapter 1, I don't have time to read all these, chapter, chapter 1, verse 5, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. God doesn't lie. We are the ones that don't believe. I will never leave you or forsake you. Even when you die, I have gone to prepare a place for you. I have punched a hole in death. I've gone ahead of you. I'm not going to leave you. To the world, you're in a casket. But to me, you are sleeping with God. Deuteronomy 3, 31 and 16, he says again, I will never leave you or forsake you. In Hebrews 13 and 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. Turn to Psalms 31. David even corrects himself. Psalms 31. Look at Psalms 31 and verse 22. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard my voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. In other words, in his, in his, in his anxiousness, in his panic, he said that God wasn't there. But then David corrects himself, and he says, look, I know now that you hear me. I know that you care for me. Jesus got abandoned. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Before we start blaming God, we've got to consider. In, in Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, he said, this shall pass. Whatever you're going through, be it sickness, being hurt, being pain, disillusionment, and all these things, it says this too shall pass. 
We are the ones that hold on to problems. We hold on to that. You know, uh, I had to watch because I got depressed when a couple of my friends died. Gary Beverly, then, and then um, Kevin died, then my mother died, then my father died, and I'm dealing with a lot of death. That, that caused me to have depression. But guess what? I can't hold on to that stuff. If I hold on to depression, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not, I can't get up and do things. God has empowered me. When we hold on to mess, Satan wants to bury you and subject, make you subject, oh, what's the word? Subject you to his will. And he wants us to blame God for everything. He wants us to blame God for all the hurt and all the pain. But it is us that hold on to that instead of holding on to gospel truth. And when we don't believe it, then we're not going to apply it. And then we're going to have the downs and the blues and whatever, and we're going to be walking around like that. And sometimes, instead of sharing the, uh, our pain, we want others to experience that pain. And we, want, we get down and out, we get down and out on other people too. In my haste, the other translation, I cried, but then I understood that you're helping me. You see, this all passed. And the beauty about Jesus in John chapter 13, the, uh, Jesus knew where he came from, and he knew where he, were, where he was going. And Jesus was on mission. He was on mission. He was laser point focused on his mission. And he didn't allow it, uh, it to happen. He didn't, he didn't, if you were to ask me, do you want to die for somebody's sins? I'd say no. There's a lot of pain there. Jesus stepped up. Because he loved us, he cared for us, and he had the almighty love of the Father. And the answer is that Jesus and God are always with us. Don't let Satan take your joy away because Jesus and God saves. It, you have to be very desperate and hopeless where you just think that God isn't there. There's no hope when God gives us hope. Even in spite of the pain, there's some, what does the Bible say? Weeping may endure for a moment. But joy comes in the morning. I've gone over time. Uh, let's wind up the lesson. So we understand that when, you understand, when we understand that you are far from me, God isn't far. It's we that placed him far, or we've gotten far away from him. We've got to understand that when we look at this, there's some feelings of abandonment in this. What God wants you to do, I'm sorry, what Satan wants to do is separate you between your relationship and God. But we understand when Jesus was dealing with his crucifixion, he was totally abandoned by God. Because God is totally good. And Jesus had no sin. But he took on the sins of the world and he sacrificed himself because he loved us. And he did what agape love means. He takes our interests before him and he cares about us to the ultimate. Remember Prince said, I will die for you? Jesus did it. But then we looked at the agony of Christ, and we look at all what he went through. That's, not, that's only a portion where the Bible is, is revealing what went through Jesus' mind. Jesus' blood is precious. So when we take our communion, we're not just taking the crackers and the juice. We are participating and fellowshipping with Christ. Do this in remembrance of him so we could remember the good love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. And the answer is that Jesus loved us. Jesus cares about us. And, G and the answer is that Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. It is we who have left God. Now, what does that mean for us? When we're on mission for Christ, we're going to have some issues that we're going to be dealing with. It is not going to be easy all the time on mission for Christ. You're going to be get discouraged. Satan is going to try to take your joy away. Uh, he's going to try to get us fighting amongst one another. It's the way I see it. No, it's the way I see it. Well, it's my way or the highway. Well, I ain't working with none of y'all. That's it. If Satan can get us fighting like mad dogs, he's happy. But see, we've got to be full of the Holy Spirit. 
and full of the love of Jesus Christ. Because being on mission isn't going to be a dance in the park. I'm on mission for Jesus. And I'm getting older. I lost my rhythm. <laughs> the thing about it is, and we think so, and the first hint of difficulty, we want to bail out. See, that's what happens. That's the problem with church folk. Because, see, church folk have all this. They're hypocrites, and they, they do all this. Uh, Again, I said this before. You got hypocrites on your job. Why haven't you quit your job? Let's get behind Jesus and do our mission. We may go through some difficulties, but guess what? God is with us. Even God says, when two or three are gathered in my name, in other words, to clear up the mess, there am I in the midst. Because I, <clears throat> I don't want none of us fighting against each other. Do we believe that? Oh. Do you believe that? Don't be afraid to speak in church. That concludes the lesson. If you need prayer, we, we ask that you make requests known to God to, and to the congregation. Uh, be wise in the way in which you share your mess. Seek out spiritual people that is going to give you a spiritual response. But if you'd like to ask for prayer, come forward. If you're dealing with issues that seem to overwhelm you and it seems like you're drowning, come, share uh, your experience and share your problems. There may be somebody in the audience that has gone through the same thing. Remember, when you go through mess, it wasn't meant for you to deal with it alone. God is with us, but we need our brothers and sisters to help one another. Let's stand to sing the song of invitation. Fall from the blue sky. Said it won't be water by this time.